Hello and welcome to Lesson 2, Part B. So we're going to dig right into a case. An 18-month-old female is brought to care by her father with a five-day history of nasal congestion, rhinorrhea, mild cough with occasional post vomiting. 24 hours ago, the child developed a fever, 101 Fahrenheit axillary, and became inconsolable, crying especially when laying down. On exam, you find a fussy but alert 18-month-old held by her father with no interest in play or exploring the exam room. Her temp is 100.9 Fahrenheit axillary, pulse is 100, respirations are 24, and unlabored. Her weight is 24 pounds. On exam further, uh, conjunctiva are clear, oral mucosa are clear, pharynx has no exudate, and is mildly erythemic. There is positive yellow-green nasal rhinorrhea bilaterally. The TMs are dull, red, and bulging bilaterally. There are anterior cervical nodes that are palpable, tender, and enlarged. The heart has a regular sinus rhythm with no murmur. Lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Her abdomen um, exam reveals bowel sounds present in four quadrants, soft and non-tender. A little side note here. Um, with children, I always examine the um, belly as well as the um, heart and lungs, even when the problem is focused to the upper respiratory system, because children tend to generalize their illnesses, and at times we're not sure exactly where the infection source is, and it's always great practice. It also ensures that we have um, a functioning GI tract, because if we are going to medicate them, that will be important. So this is straight from the Lieberthal article, which I um, wanted you to be sure to reference as you looked at cases like this. And this is kind of the progression from the left to right of how um, ears look when folks have um, are examined. Um, of course, when you look in with your otoscope, you only see through a little pinhole, so you, you kind of have to move around a little to see parts of the ear like this. Um, but these photographs do show to the left kind of a normal um, uh, eardrum or tympanic membrane. Um, B is um, some bulging of the tympanic membrane with loss of um, landmarks and some fluid collection behind, and possibly some erythema indicative of early infection. C and D really are showing that um, very um, bulging eardrum. Um, D is a little um, misleading because it looks kind of purplish, but it's really um, that redness and the bulging that clues you in that there is um, basically pus behind the eardrum. And as you know from thinking about the mechanism of how otitis media occurs, the cold starts first and then clogs up the eustachian tube. And um, as I tell parents, um, the eustachian tube drains the inner ear, and if it's unable to do so, germs that are normally present up in the upper respiratory tract kind of climb in behind the tympanic membrane and, if you will, have a little pus party. So that's what I kind of tell them to explain why it is that their child is having such discomfort. Now, so we, we've made a diagnosis, of course, of ot acute otitis media. And don't get confused because otitis media with effusion, OME, is a different animal than acute otitis media, which is the bacterial or pus behind the eardrum kind of ear infection. Also not to be uh, confused with otitis externa. Um, and so when we are thinking, you know, what are the usual organism, what are the usual suspects in this case, like we discussed in our last lesson, we have a lot of ways to think about this. We can go and look at articles like the clinical guideline that tells us these facts. We can also open our Sanford guide. And if you haven't yet um, had a chance to do so, please, um, and you're not familiar with the Sanford guide, especially the paper version, there is an online version that's fairly intuitive. But um, I did create a little video which you can um, access and I've posted in the envelope, uh, in the lesson folder rather, for you to look at. And you can figure out which organisms are causative for this particular infection. And as you look there, kind of the top one is um, our good old friend Strep pneumoniae, as we discuss in the um, 
the little tutorial about the Sanford Guide. Um, uh, there are some other um, organisms that can be present. Again, it's kind of a mixed bag. We don't do cultures and sensitivities on children's ears when we're tr trying to decide how to treat them. That would necessitate us holding down a squalling child, inserting a sharp and pointy instrument into their ear canal, getting a sample of the pus that is behind the eardrum usually, um, although occasionally they will um, burst the eardrum, have a uh, a, uh, a uh, ruptured tympanic membrane, uh, which actually relieves their pain because it is like a pimple and it pops. Um, but really, um, in practical terms, we do not um, do a culture and sensitivity, but we treat empirically. So we open our Stanford's guide and we find that for acute otitis media, these are the um, normal organisms, including the strep pneumonia and virus, um, which is actually a, um, a possibility. Um, and in older children, um, as you see in your Sanford guide, we might use a watch and wait um, strategy. But in this case, the child is younger than two. Some sources um, make different differentiations, but for Sanford, it's younger than two. Um, and so, <clears throat> There's also Haemophilus influenza, and um, uh, M. catarrhalis is another one of the organisms. So which class of antibiotics? Um, and um, the specific choices that we make, um, again, we look at our Sanford guide and we see, okay, um, amoxicillin, high dose, HD on amoxicillin is our first choice. But we want to know some other things before prescribing, and there's reasons for this. In children who, um, older children particularly, who are in daycare environments or exposed to other children who have been treated with antibiotics recently, or they themselves have been treated in, with antibiotics recently, they will find, you will find that there is a lot more of the um, resistant organism um, around their environment and in, um, in their um, inner ear. And at least empirically, we know this. So we want to, um, adjust our um, protocol accordingly. And in your Sanford guide, it clearly says if they've had um, uh, antibiotics in the last um, um, prior month, um, we want to change the antibiotic to something like um, amoxicillin with clavulinate. Clavulinate is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. Now, you remember that these are beta-lactam um, drugs, and there are bacterium who, of course, have created an enzyme to fight off the beta-lactam ring, and it is called beta-lactamase. Um, so, of course, we want to fight the beta-lactamase. Now, you might say to me, well, why don't we just give that to everyone? Well, first of all, it's too much for most, most children with this infection. It's not necessarily, again, we try to narrow our spectrum. And secondly, it has um, pretty severe side effects in terms of GI distress and diarrhea. Now, of course, if they're allergic to penicillin, they need to move into another um, category of medication. Sometimes um, we will um, use uh, um, azithromycin or uh, z pack if you will, if we talk about adults with pills, but with children, it's a liquid form of that or clarithromycin, which, and these again are um, not necessarily very helpful with um, um, some of the um, organisms that cause the infection. And we're working a bit blindly, but we do have to make that choice. The other thought is that a lot of the cephalosporins, especially the higher generation cephalosporins, are very effective for otitis media, and they are often used when we've had multiple infections to kind of chase down the um, resistant organisms. Um, however, um, there is a small chance of cross-reactivity for children who have reacted to amoxicillin or penicillin in the past with an anaphylactic reaction. Now, I, make, I want to emphasize that it's anaphylactic reaction where we really are worried about giving them a cephalosporin because of that cross-reactivity. Again, it's very small, but we don't really like to take the risk. 
Um, and once again, um, just to kind of acquaint you with your resources, um, here we look at the, um, the website that I referred you to to um, look at the, uh, the clinical guideline that is published by the American Academy of um, um, Pediatricians to help us take a look at what we should do. And the key recommendations are listed early on in the article. Very helpful for us, so we don't have to read the whole article. But it, the key recommendations in a case like this, even though this is not a very sick child, they do not have a very high fever, etc., that we can go ahead and use an antibiotic, and it is a recommendation. Again, if the child's a little bit older, older than two in this case, we might wait. But if they had very high fever, they were very sick looking, weren't taking um, nourishment and so forth, we would make a judgment call to go ahead and treat them with an antibiotic course. In all cases, we're talking, if we're talking amoxicillin, we're talking high dose. So it will behoove you to take a look at that particular clinical guideline. So now we think about what um, would the drug um, prescription read like. So I'm going to leave you with this little um, mini assignment to think about. Which drug, again, just like we said um, in class about writing prescriptions, we first identify the drug and we've said we know it's amoxicillin. The book says high dose. We don't write high dose. We write amoxicillin. But in order to get the high dose, we're probably going to have to use a fairly concentrated form of amoxicillin. So we'll look in our Hippocrates and look for a dose of amoxicillin that will um, be um, fairly concentrated, like 400 milligrams per 5 mLs. Keep in mind that um, the dose... Um, we have to calculate the dose per 5 mL if we're doing manual calculations. Hippocrates helps us out with this. We choose the drug, we choose the dosage form, and we put in the patient's weight, and it gives us um, the number of mLs per um, so many hours, whether we give it twice or three times a day. A lot of times when we write the prescription or even e-prescribe, we will translate our dosage to household measures. So a teaspoon is five milliliters or um, cc's. Um, and if we um, tell the parent to give a teaspoon twice daily, that means they're getting 400 milligrams. Um, if it's supplied as 400 milligrams per five ml, given teaspoon is 400 milligrams are being given. We have to re define all of these things on our prescription and of course the reason for the prescription and the number of refills. In the case of antibiotics, we never give refills uh, for this. We also need to give the total number of milliliters to dispense, so we have to kind of do the math there. Again, your electronic prescribing programs will have a, um, a little calculator to kind of tell you um, sometimes about that. It is, um, you know, it is old practice and customary for prescribers to say dispense quantity sufficient, but I do not want you to get into that habit. I want you to actually create the prescription. So prepare the prescription and bring it with you to class next time, and we'll compare notes about this particular prescription. Of course, we've got to teach Dad um, about the um, um, medication, its side effects, how to manage things, managing the vomiting. Now, the vomiting that was described in this case study is post-tussive vomiting, which means after the child coughed, they vomited, cough, 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 vomit. That's not true vomiting, and they probably will be fine. Um, the idea about vomiting that we say with medications is if they can keep it down for about a half hour, we're probably pretty good. We try to tell the parent not to overfeed or over, um, don't give them too much liquid to try to, to chase the antibiotic um, because they'll vomit that because of size. Pain management, well managed here with Tylenol and or ibuprofen liquid, again, dosed according to weight. And of course, side effects are the common ones for all antibiotics, particularly GI tract sensitivity. Um, and those are the um, the most important ones that are common side effects, and then we do have adverse reactions.
I'll end with a cute little cartoon that you can look at, at your, on your own.